seat. It's wonderful to see you all here this afternoon. My name is Susan Johnson. I'm a career <coughs> foreign service officer and currently the president of the American Foreign Service Association. AFSA is a professional association of the foreign service personnel of the Departments of State, Commerce, Agriculture, USAID, and the International Broadcasting Board. The Adair Lecture on Diplomacy in the U.S. Foreign Service is an annual event and one of our favorites. Organized by American University, the Caroline and Charles Adair Memorial Fund, and AFSA. We are honored today by the presence of Marshall Adair, Senior Foreign Service Officer, former AFSA President, who serves as trustee for the Caroline and Ambassador Charles Adair Memorial Fund. The Adair Memorial Fund's annual grants enable this series. Ambassador Adair and his spouse Caroline were exemplary American diplomats, widely respected for their dedication and commitment to the Foreign Service and to American diplomacy. Thank you, Marshall, and to all the Adair family members present for your generosity. We are indeed fortunate to have as today's speaker, Ambassador Chaz Green. Ambassador Freeman is a veteran and esteemed diplomat, much admired for bringing fresh perspectives on world issues and American diplomacy that are both insightful and provocative. And we're looking for the provocative today. <laughs> AFSA wishes to take this opportunity to express special thanks to Dr. James Goldgaard, Dean of the School of International Service, and to Dr. Carola Watt, the incoming Dean of the School of Professional and Extended Studies, as well as to Professor Christian Maish for their superb collaboration in hosting this speaker series. It truly is one of our favorite annual events. So thank you very much. <laughs> Just a few words about Dr. Lyle. She's in her sixth day, she told me here. She joined American University just this summer as the new Dean of the School of Professional and Extended Studies, the new home of the American Semester and other continuing education programs. Earlier, Dr. Waddle had multiple appointments with the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism, most recently as the school's Director of International and Strategic Partnerships and Associate Dean for Planning and Strategic Initiatives. Her over 20 years of experience in higher education will surely be instrumental in the continued enhancement of the School of Professional and Extended Studies. So welcome, Dr. Lyle. <laughs> we live in a complex world that's constantly changing. At the end of the Cold War, in a world without rivals, the United States had an extraordinary opportunity for global leadership. But in the past two decades, the world situation has evolved, bringing new challenges that are and will remain challenges for U.S. diplomacy. I hope that many of you here today will be both inspired and challenged to make diplomacy your career and profession. If you'd like to know more about what diplomats do, AFSA's recently published new edition of Inside the U.S. Embassy provides unique first-person accounts of what American Foreign Service officers actually do, from the ambassador on down. There are copies and ordering information on the table at the front door, so I hope you stop by. It's now my great pleasure to present Dr. Carola Wild, who's going to introduce the next speakers, Dr. Wild.
I would like to join Ms. Johnson in thanking uh, our uh, uh, hosts and guests, uh, our deep gratitude to Carol Adair Finn, Mr. Marshall Adair, Ms. Ginger Adair, and the Adair family for their most generous support. It really is a wonderful and a fitting living tribute to the life and service of two great Americans, Caroline and Ambassador Charles Adair. As a student of international relations, I am particularly pleased to co-host this excellent lecture, and I would like to add as a personal footnote, I actually grew up in the foreign service, and it was but a turn of fate that had me going in a different direction, but in many ways, this is like a homecoming to me, because I really do feel that I have one toe, at least, in diplomacy, and I'm delighted to be part of this group. As the dean of the School of Professional Extended Studies, um, I'm delighted because one of the key missions of our school is to educate the next generation of U.S. and world leaders by engaging them with current generation of leaders through lectures, with prominent guest speakers, as well as through internships and many other activities that bridge the gap between academia and professional world. So we see ourselves as a partner to the good work that the School of International Services doing, other members of this fine university, and serving as a link and a toehold to the real world as well. We do this through multiple numbers of programs. Of course, uh, one of our flagship programs is the 65-year-old Washington Semester Program, which brings upper-class undergraduate students and graduate students to D.C. Our, uh, not quite the little, but already quite the uh, long-standing Washington internship program for native students, and I'm pleased to say I think it's one of the few in the country, if any, that provides opportunities to Native American students to gain professional experience in Washington. Our Washington mentorship program, which provides opportunities to first-year students admitted to American University as well as several partner universities as well as programs in graduate studies, the graduate gateway program. We are very excited about launching new programs targeted to an adult audience, and uh, hope you will stay tuned for more information on some of those. Last but not certainly least, it is my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. James Goldgeier, who is the Dean of the American University School of International Service. Prior to joining American University in the summer of up on me, and he has been an incredible guy uh, to me. He was a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. He has taught at Cornell University and has held appointments at Stanford University, Center for International Security and Cooperation, the State Department, the National Security Council staff, the Brookings Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Hoover Institution, as well as the Woodrow Wilson Center, among others. Uh, I don't think there's an agency in town that hasn't had the duties. <laughs> From 2001 to 2005, he directed George Washington University's Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. And his most recent book, America Between the Wars, from 11.9 to 9.11, co-authored with Derek Chillen, was named the best book of 2008 by Slate and the favorite book of 2008 by the Daily Beast. For those of us who are still tied to old media, these may seem like strange names, but this means that Professor Dean Goldfire is truly part of the future generation of educators, and I'm delighted to welcome him here today. Uh, Dean Goldfire's areas of expertise include contemporary international relations, American foreign policy, and transatlantic security. So without further ado, involved 
introducing these amazing speakers who come to American University and then immediately going to my next event uh, and not having the opportunity to actually hear the discussion. So uh, yet again, uh, I can only be jealous of all of you uh, for being able to be here today uh, to hear uh, what Ambassador Freeman has to say. But I, I just want to congratulate uh, Susan uh, and Marshall uh, for uh, this wonderful event. Uh, and welcome also, I know we have a number of retired foreign service officers here, uh, and so just uh, extend my welcome to them, and, and especially one of our recent alums of the year in SAS Clyde together. So I'm uh, delighted to have uh, so many of you here. Um, the, when you look at Ambassador Freeman's bios, it's quite daunting, and particularly um, his involvement in some of the most momentous events in the modern history of American foreign policy. Uh, he's not simply one of America's most distinguished diplomats, but he was uh, uh, the principal American interpreter during President Nixon's visit uh, to Beijing in 1972. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, uh, he later was ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, during the first Gulf War. So quite a quite a set of events uh, in addition to all the other things uh, that he's done. He entered the Foreign Service in 1965. Uh, he served uh, in a number of capacities in, in addition to the ones uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, and um, after his uh, ambassadorship in Saudi Arabia, in the early Clinton administration, he was Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Uh, since 1995, Ambassador Freeman has chaired Projects International, a Washington-based firm that specializes in helping uh, American foreign, and foreign clients arrange transactions and set up business operations uh, across borders. Uh, he's been involved in negotiations with over 100 governments, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, just uh, an extraordinarily distinguished career uh, across a range of countries and, and agencies in the U.S. government. Um, he received his, uh, his undergraduate degree from Yale University, his JD from Harvard Law School, and in 1995 was elected to the American Academy of Diplomacy. We're extremely fortunate to have Ambassador Chess Bates here uh, at American University today. So welcome, Ambassador.
security as an immovable military object, if not yet an irresistible military force. Our political influence, economic clout, and self-confidence are not what they used to be. The sequester and the political dysfunction that led us through it promised to weaken us still more. Major adjustments in U.S. policies and diplomacy are overdue. Global governance was once mainly a vector of the struggle between the two superpowers and the blocs that they led. After Moscow defaulted on the Cold War and dropped out of the contest for worldwide dominion domination, Americans briefly imagined that our national economic strength and unchallengeable military supremacy would enable us unilaterally to shape the world to our advantage. In the first decade of this century, however, the wizards of Wall Street brought down the global economy, even as they discredited the so-called Washington Consensus and emasculated the once robust image of American capitalism. Meanwhile, much of the world was disappointed by the lack of U.S. leadership on other issues ranging from climate change to peace in the Middle East. People everywhere looked, hopefully, to worldwide institutions like the United Nations, the G20, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization. None of them proved up the job. Responsibility for the regulation of the planetary political economy began to devolve to its regions, if only by default. The globally coherent worldwide order that American power configured itself to enforce after the Cold War is clearly morphing into something new. We can see the outlines of the new order, even if we cannot yet make out its details and don't know what to call it. The post-Cold War era is long gone. The American century ended 11 years ago on 9-11. We are exiting the age of anti-terrorism. We are uncertain against whom we should deploy our incomparable military might, or to what international purposes we should bend ourselves. Call it what you will, this is an era of enemy deprivation syndrome. <laughs> there is no overarching context to define our worldview. The international system is once again governed by multiple contentions and shifting strategic geometry. In such a world, diplomatic agility is as important as constancy of commitment or more so. Before the Cold War, the United States twice fought in coalition with Britain, France, Australia, Canada, and a few other countries, but we had no permanent alliances. The Soviet threat and the need to deal with the instabilities that attended the end of European empires in Asia and Africa led Americans to reverse our tradition of aversion to foreign entanglements and to embrace them with a vengeance. The United States ultimately extended formal protection to about a fourth of the world's countries and informal protection to yet another fourth. In our usage, the word ally lost its original sense of accomplice and came to be protector, not partner. There have been huge changes in the global security environment since the collapse of our Soviet enemy. But there have been no adjustments at all in our alliances, our alliance and defense commitments to foreign nations, other than their enlargement. The alliance structure we built in the Cold War has long outlived the foe that was created in the country. Remarkably, however, the preservation of our prestige at the head of that alliance structure seems to have become the principal objective of our foreign policy. Carrying on with approaches that address long disappeared realities rather than adjusting to new circumstances is patently dysfunctional behavior. It represents the triumph of complacency and inertia over reason, statesmanship, and strategy. With a few obvious exceptions, like Israel, South Korea, and Saudi Arabia, the beneficiaries of our military protection do not agree if they face threats to their independence and prosperity that justify higher levels of defense spending. Our allies have been cutting, not increasing, defense budgets. This has not, of course, stopped us from boosting our own military spending to the point that, depending on how you calculate it, 
it's somewhere between seven eighths and one and one eighth as much as the rest of the world combined. The power of the United States once spoke for itself. Americans expected automatic deference. But the new world order that's coming into being is multipolar, neither guided nor managed by the United States. Militarily powerful as we are and will remain, we cannot expect foreigners to follow our directives. We must instead help them to see the need to do things in their own interest that happen also to be in ours. As Lester Pearson once put it, diplomacy is letting someone else have their own way. <laughs> Since they don't perceive much need for our protection, U.S. allies do not display much gratitude for it. They can't think why they should object to our spending money to leave them with the burden of defending themselves <laughs> against hypothetical or unknown dangers. But unlike the past, they also see no need to repay U.S. RHS by lining up with us on issues in which their own interests are not directly engaged. Some might consider it astonishing that for our part, we Americans have been asked what specific interests of ours are still served by the alliance structures we built to deal with the late unlamented USSR. There are a lot of things wrong with the foreign policy that's mostly on the mindless military autopilot. It deploys U.S. forces abroad to perpetuate our credibility as a superpower, rather than to pursue well-defined political, military, or economic ends. It treats military spending as a perpetual industrial subsidy or ongoing fiscal stimulus, rather than as a measured response to identifiable external threats. It drives diplomacy toward a futile effort to persuade allies to join us in disinvesting in the future by borrowing money to build military rather than civilian infrastructure and engaging in a constantly expanding list of wars of choice. As we pre prepare to enter a still nameless new era, it's time for Americans to take a fresh look at the world. In this regard, the much feared sequester could be a very good thing. It might compel us to rethink what is really necessary and to craft an affordable approach to national security as well as a foreign policy to implement it. Our present approach is neither affordable nor effective. In a world where the United States no longer calls, calls most of the shots, and cannot totally dominate every region of the globe, we must learn how to deal with other great powers on a basis of equality and mutual respect. China is the most obvious test of our ability to do so. In recent decades, it has been making a century of progress every 15 years. It's now our economic competitor everywhere. It's still a political military force only on its own East, Central, and South Asian peripheries. Russia is again a regional, not a world power. Its huge strategic arsenal simply demonstrates the irrelevance of nuclear weapons to anything but deterrence against the nuclear weapons of others. The European Union has made Europe its own peace, but it is an economic superpower that is too disorganized to act globally. Brazil may be primus in Paris, in South America and in India, they reign supreme in South Asia, but both are in strategic regions disconnected from the global tensions that preoccupy Americans. By contrast, the Second World War showed us that the Indo-Pacific region was a coherent strategic zone from which hostile forces could marshal resources to project power globally, including in North America. That same region, of course, was where the bloodiest proxy conflicts of the Cold War took place in Korea and Vietnam. The strategic importance 
states seem to determine to resist any diminution of our own role as the ultimate arbiter of regional security issues. As a result, you are being drawn into supporting claimants to islands, rocks, and reefs also claimed by China. But our capacity to dominate China's periphery has a limited half-life. China's defense burden remains low, but its spending has been doubling every five years or so, a pace with its overall national budget and economy. China's focus on defending itself in its own region, not on projecting power beyond it. Defense is cheaper than offense, which is what we specialize in. It's not necessary to, dom to dominate a region in order to deter efforts by others to do so. We don't need to enjoy unchallengeable military superiority in Asia in order to enable our allies and friends there to learn to live with drawing Chinese wealth and power, which we ourselves must also do. Dominance of Asia is unaffordable. Even a less ambitious and more appropriate balancing role is going to be hugely expensive. We're talking about balancing the power of a country that is expected within 40 years to have a GDP that's at least twice the size of ours. If we are determined for some reason to contest China's research and influence in its own region, we better have our economic act together. Otto von Bismarck once remarked that God looks after fools, drunks in the United States of America. <laughs> I always pray that this was a valid religious revelation. <laughs> but a belief in a special providence for our country cannot excuse or offset the effects of self-destructive policies. We may not be in decline, but we're certainly in denial. <laughs> America is no longer setting the pace of international. It's pointless to blame others for this. Though our problems sometimes have been bound up in global supply chains, they have mostly been made in the USA by American politicians. The depression we are in was crafted by elected officials in Washington working with tax hunter plutocrats on Wall Street. There's no denying that they did what they did with the mostly admiring endorsement of the American people. America has shown uncommon resilience in the past, but there is no reason to believe that the structural predicaments now afflicting us will automatically correct itself. We must change the wide range of policies and practices that we are to restore our traditional socioeconomic vigor and buoyancy. We need to do this for its own sake. But it's also the key to assuring ourselves the role in shaping the global future, which our interests commend. Some aspects of our current condition are frankly disheartening. The United States was founded on a promise of equality of opportunity. Yet we now rank 100 out of the top 140 nations in income equality. Horatio Alger would be horrified to learn how much less social mobility there now is in America in comparison with much of Europe, let alone China. Many here have come to doubt that hard work will pay off in financial and social success. But then it's now notoriously hard for Americans to find work at all. Economists define depression as, quote, a chronic condition of subnormal activity for a considerable period, without any mark, marked tendency either towards recovery or towards collapse. We may not like the word depression. Our politicians won't speak it, but we're in one. The unemployment rate is going down largely because people are dropping out of the job market. Over the past five years, the labor participation rate, that is the percentage of our fellow citizens who are either employed or actively seeking employment, has fallen to the point where there are now 100 million Americans of working age who do not have jobs. There will be more if our Congress does not rise to the challenges before it. Fiscal suicide will not cure the public policy problems Americans have made for ourselves. The US government is now borrowing 25.9% of what it spends. 25.9%. That is an amount equivalent to 11% of GDP. 
Despite all this spending, our transportation and other infrastructure is decaying. The results of our educational system are ever more mediocre. Our investment in science and engineering is going down. And our public health system, which costs more, delivers less for the money than any other in the world, is becoming an even costlier burden on our economy. As other nations invest in competitiveness, we are disinvesting in it in favor of wasteful spending on hyper-expensive weaponry and insolvent welfare and pension schemes. Our balance of trade and payments deficits are not being corrected. There is no prospect our budget will be balanced anytime soon. The only sector of our economy that is prospering is its bloated military industrial complex. This cannot go on forever. So sooner or later, it will stop. Technology has annihilated distance linking people across the globe with unprecedented immediacy. As the Ghanaian diplomat, Coach of Deborah, put it, quote, radio enables people to hear all evil, television enables them to see all evil, and the jet plane enables them to go out and do all evil. <laughs> My bad. Businesses are no longer limited to national labor and capital markets. They locate their operations where they want to maximize their profits. They hire where labor costs are lowest in relation to productivity, and they borrow where rates are most favorable to their competitive participation in worldwide supply chains. Their executives may feel patriotism. Their business plans treated as an advertising gift. In this highly competitive environment, the advantage goes to those nations and regions that excel at the education of their workforces, the modernization of their infrastructure, and the crafting of intelligent industrial policies to empower entrepreneurial innovation and the exploitation of new technologies. The decisive factors in all these elements of competitiveness are the competence of the nation's politicians, the coherence of its policies and the quality and timeliness of its decision making. Now, more than ever, the domestic policies of societies determine the success or failure of their foreign interactions as well as their domestic condition. To restore American dynamism, we need a great deal more results-oriented reasoning on the part of our politicians than we've seen so far this century. Instead of railing at our foreign competitors, we should be learning from them. We have a tax code stitched together by a million special interests over the course of a century. This serves as our de facto industrial policy, directing investment and other business decisions in ways that subsidize vested interests and secure the status quo. Our tax system obstructs rather than facilitates economic construction <coughs> to make our economy more productive, prosperous, and competitive. It's got to go. It's been decades since the United States dominated global manufacturing or was the world's greatest predator rather than debt creation. And it's been a long time since we drove liberalization of trade and investment regimes at the global level. The Doha round failed. There's no success with it. We can't afford to continue to base our trade and investment policies on assumptions drawn from circumstances that no longer exist. These policies badly need adjustment to promote innovation, ensure efficient infrastructure, improve the business climate, and raise the quality of the workforce. But many of the international trade agreements we're currently pursuing seem to aim less at leveraging foreign prosperity to our advantage, expanding our exports, attracting investment, repositioning our industry and in regional markets, or increasing our competitiveness than at shoring up our heavy standing abroad. We need to refocus our trade and investment policies on job creation. I want to conclude by returning briefly to a vitally important aspect of the evolving world order that is far too seldom discussed. For two centuries, North American, North Atlantic societies, sorry, excuse me, North Atlantic societies set the pace of economic and technological advance and wrote the rules for the international system. 
transatlantic solidarity, enabled capitalism, liberal democratic values, the rule of the law, and the idea of the nation state to prevail over challenges from all of the alternatives. The ideals of Atlantic civilization found expression in the universal acceptance of a rule-bound international system and institutions of global governance based on Western norms. Sadly, this heritage is now slipping into the past or in danger of doing so. The North Atlantic is clearly being displaced by the Indo-Pacific as the global economic center of gravity. Most strikingly, Western societies no longer present compelling models that other nations and regions wish to emulate. Our democracy, our democracy, is increasingly equated with political venality, short-sightedness, indecision, and lack of strategic resolve. But the problem has been compounded by the foundering of the transatlantic consensus since 9-11. Our own divisions now cast doubt on the core values of Western civilization and their durability. Europeans and Americans have come to disagree about an expanding array of issues bearing on the rights of the individual. These differences are passionate and fundamental. They include arguments about the propriety of so-called enhanced methods of interrogation, otherwise known as torture, extraordinary rendition, meaning kidnapping and disappearance, the suspension of habeas corpus in favor of indefinite detention without charge, the withholding of evidence from the accused, and the extrajudicial administration of capital punishment. North Atlantic societies are still vastly more respectful of the dignity and rights of individuals than others. But the region as a whole no longer shares a coherent code of values with which to challenge the conscience of humanity. Lacking both consensus and conviction, its member states cannot effectively defend, let alone advance, the Western notion of the rule of law against competing ideologies from Islam or Confucianism. For the first time in centuries, non-Western values are coming to be seen as realistic alternatives to Western norms. America's recent departures from the rule of law are in many ways the greatest menace our freedoms have ever faced. Our country faces no external existential threat comparable to that of the whole. There's nobody who's out there thinking about turning the key and killing 80 million Americans 17 minutes late. Yet we're building a garrison state that is eating away at our liberties in the name of faith. Peace is the climate in which freedom is grow. We need an end to war in order to address the many threats to our ability to secure the lessons of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Americans believe that societies that respect the rule of law and rely upon democratic debate to make decisions are more prosperous, successful, and stable than those that do not. Recent efforts to impose our freedoms on others by force have reminded us that they can be spread only by our setting an example that others see as worthy of emulation. Freedom cannot be sustained if we ourselves violate its principles. This means that we must respect the right of others to make their own choices as long as they do not harm us. It also presupposes a contest of ideas. Our ideas will not prosper unless we maintain solidarity with others who value and practice them. That's why the first priority of American diplomacy ought to be to reforge the unity of the Atlantic community behind the concept of the rule of law. This cannot be done unless we confront and correct our own lapses from the great traditions of our republic. To re-empower our diplomacy by inspiring others to look to our leadership, we must restore our respect for our Bill of Rights, as well as our governance to the dignity of the individual, both at home and abroad. And let me be specific. We must revive the Fourth Amendment's ban on searches and seizures of persons, houses, papers, and other personal effects without probable cause. No more extraordinary rendition. No more universal electronic eavesdropping. More warrantless seizure of paper and electronic records at the border. An intrusive inspection of anything and everything in the possession of passengers using public transportation. We must reinstate the Fifth Amendment's protections against deprivation of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. No more suspension of habeas corpus or executive branch assertions of the right to detain or even kill people, including American citizens, 
turn, the Sixth Amendment's guarantee of the right of anyone accused of other crime to be informed of the charges and confronted with the witnesses against him and to be represented by a lawyer. No more secret evidence. We must reinstate the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishments, including torture. And we must reaffirm our adherence to the several Geneva Conventions. We Americans can have no credibility as advocates for human rights if we do not practice what we preach. In short, the path to renewed effectiveness in American diplomacy lies not just in wise and expert statecraft and the professionalization of those who implement it. It rests on the rebuilding of credibility through the rediscovery of the values that made our country great. Can we fix that amplification, Tom? I'm sorry? 
I say, can we fix the amplification? <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear it. Very close, very close, right? Absolutely. I mean, 
but it is a much smaller number than our natural resource base we support. We are over endowed with water, with agricultural land. We are protected from the rest of the world to our east and west by great oceans, to our north and south by congenial neighbors. Um, and uh, we don't face the challenges that let us say China. If, if an American general were running the Chinese military, they would have a defense budget four or five times as large as we do. Because they've got Russia on their north, India on their southwest, Vietnam uh, to their south, uh, Japan, which has a history of rampage through China, uh, to uh, their east, uh, the Koreans who are not easy to live with uh, next door, and the Seventh Fleet off, off their coast. Uh, there's no way that we would trade our very uh, excellent position for that. Uh, so I have a lot of optimism about the United States if we can cure what I describe as our evidence. Um, and that is nothing to stop us from doing that. There's nothing to stop us from re-examining our own practices and correctness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 
prosperity of Americans has been aided, but not partaked, perhaps, by the explosion of items in Walmart. Um, and um, so it's been good. And I always remember, uh, years ago, uh, the incentive schemes of the Department of Agriculture through the Foreign Agricultural Service in Nigeria, of all places. They introduced the donut to Nigeria. Um, now that was a cruel thing to do, perhaps. Uh, but uh, once the Nigerians got on to the glazed donut, um, they began to import wheat, wheat which they never done before. And it became a major wheat market. Um, so we helped them develop um, spatially uh, as well. <laughs> It's not just in Southeast 
huge expenditures in the Department of Defense on building an intellectual superstructure for the coercive, for a coercive approach to international relations. In your own life, as outside the Army Preserve, um, if you get into an argument with someone, you're very unlikely to pull a gun on them, or to imagine that standing on the other side of the street and giving them the finger uh, is an effective means of getting through to their conscience. And yet, um, the United States has developed a practice of immediately resorting to coercive measures, usually sanctions, which Luther Wilson has described as a substitute for war. They turn out to be credited for war, not a substitute. Sanctions followed by the U.S. Marines or the Army or whoever. Uh, um, and we have developed a set of academic theories funded by the Defense Department, and thank them for that, game theory, simulations, all kinds of international relations theories that are based on the principle that the effective conduct of foreign relations rests on coercion. But in your own life, if you want to have someone do what you want them to do, you know that there are vastly more efficient and effective and economical ways of doing that than assaulting them physically. And so um, I think we have a mental imbalance that comes from 40 some years of the Cold War and is expressed in the really amazing continued momentum of defense budgets even after credible threats have disappeared. Um, you know, uh, we have now a defense budget, we have a military industrial complex, we also have an anti terrorism industrial complex. Uh, and uh, the two together are fairly committed, and they are not attractive, and they have done huge damage to the influence of our country, and they've also done huge damage to the way we think about solving problems. So I'd argue that there needs to be a recalibration uh, in our budget, in our allocations, in our, in our approaches uh, toward returning the use of force to the last resort that it once was, rather than the first recourse, which it has become. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.